and welcome to Future Imperfect. I'm your host, Steve Megatron, and joining me is Captain of the Future Imperfect. That's right, I'm deciding to take back my ship as we've been away in the Beta Quadrant for a little while. That's right, it is I, Mike the Birdman Dog, taking a little bit of a return from my medical hiatus, hoping to be back more full-time probably come June slash July. But uh, Steve asked me to do a Future Imperfect, and uh, we got some exciting changes coming up for the show, don't we, Steve? Yes, we do. Um, first of all, we're going to be covering a little bit of the Star Trek uh, uh, Discovery, and then uh, a little bit of Star Trek Online, which I know you have not played in the last year, but uh, being I just jumped back into it about a, a week and a half ago, um, it's kind of enveloped my life over the last week. Um <laughs> And then uh, a little bit of Mass Effect, and uh, you said some Stargate, I believe. Yeah, like, what we're going to be doing with, with Future Imperfect moving forward, obviously Star Trek will always be a primary focus, but kind of expanding things out to include more general sci-fi topics and science in general. As me and Steve, this is more kind of our area of expertise as opposed to doing stuff with, say, uh, TFG on Mike, who's more pop culture focused. And when we do things on Altered Geek, doing things on Future and Perfect allows us to focus on more science and just more sci-fi in general. Because that seems to be where like me and Steve have the meeting of the mind, so to speak. Oh, so yeah. If you, so if you want to hear about stuff from, like, say, Battlestar Galactica or Mass Effect or just, you know, what's happening in the world of space exploration then uh, you've definitely come to the right place. And even just talking about science in general, if something really cool happens, I'm sure we'll be able to cover it uh, here on Future Imperfect. So um, I guess without any further ado, let's kind of jump into Star Trek Discovery because that was supposed to premiere next month. Yeah, that's not happening. Well, it was supposed to have the the pilot um, in January, if you remember. Yep. Um, and they were supposed to have it on CBS, and then having the uh, the app launch with the show, and having it exclusively show up in May, um, which is not happening. My guess is now what they've said from the production team is they don't have an, a date ready yet for the show, which I wouldn't call that indicative of trouble just yet. My guess is they're saving it for Comic-Con or New York City Comic-Con. And you'll, you'll see the full episode, my guess is, in the next six month, months. My guess is it won't premiere this year. Or if it does, it'll premiere during the fall. Um, which I wouldn't say is a completely missed opportunity because they are producing 13 episodes. I'd rather them take the time to do them right, because I think they wrapped principal photography a couple of weeks ago, uh, which they were filming uh, in Toronto, so not too far away from where I now live. Um, and it was being produced under the code name Green Harvest. Now, I've got a lot of friends in the Toronto film industry, and I haven't heard anything native coming out of it yet. I would have by now. But I haven't heard so, anything positive either. Yeah, I haven't heard anything good either, and that's almost more worrying than hearing anything now, bad. At least. most of the news has been on the castings, um, mm -hmm. so of course there's that. Then there's the um, the fact that uh, we have, in addition to the castings, we have the timeline, which takes place ten years before the original series, which I think is a mega fail. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we've kind of already seen. I mean, we've seen Star Trek Enterprise, we've seen the original series. Now, while I'll give them what Enterprise did, uh, it, granted, I have to go back and watch it, um, and I will say that um, some of the temporal stuff that happens in Enterprise is tied into the Star Trek Online game. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of continuity that I'm like oh, I remember this from this episode, and I remember this from this episode. Um, because there's a lot of uh, Enterprise, the original series, um, Next Generation, DS9, Voyager, um, and beyond, and the Kelvin universe even, that shows up in the, the game. And so, to me, it, while I get kind of what they're doing here, 
they're having uh, one. They're having a female captain, which I think is good, even though she's I not think... technically a captain. She's a lieutenant commander, but that True. doesn't reduce the fact that she's commanding her own ship. But what I find to be a little bit of a failure is at this particular time period, that wouldn't have happened. I don't think that's entirely true. I mean, it's not entirely right. true, but thinking back on the original series continuity. You didn't see a lot of females in command position. You didn't see any mind, females in command position in the original you, that series. That was also just on television. If you look at the expanded universe novels, whether they count as <laughs> canon or not, there may have been more people there. And I'm pretty sure there were some women in command at Starfleet Command at that time. Mind you, because what we see is representative on TV, the, you know, times are changing at that time, in, like, socially in the real world. So it wouldn't surprise me. I'm not trying to sound were, sexist oh, yeah, oh, yeah. with it. I, I, oh, I completely get where what. You know, I'm going at it strictly from, like, a continuity from what we've seen. Like, if you're just taking the shows from a strict continuity purpose, um, one, it's being, it's got that shiny look that the Abrams universe had. Yeah, and that's um, something I'm not a huge fan of, because that's part of the problem setting this 10 years before the original series. The The look just doesn't work. Well, I've seen the ship. The ship looks like... it's too. It looks too fake. It looks too shiny. Um, it looks like something I would see in the video game of Star Trek Online. Um, it doesn't fit with the aesthetic of the time period. No, it, it doesn't. And the they show the command chair trying to like tease something with nothing and honestly i would have preferred that they did something between star trek 7 and tng yeah because that would have been more like interesting well there's there's 70 years of nothing well yeah because then you have the possibility of updating the the technology to the more tng look and filling in like you said that 70 year gap Whereas it's 10 years before the original series. Ooh, who cares? Well, and, and the rumor has it is that they're going to bump into some of the original series characters. Well, I know they're going to bump into Harry Mudd, which... Or, is that his name, Harry Mudd? Yeah, it's a version yeah. of him, of hardcore yeah. Harry Mudd. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're going to have um, uh, Ray and Wilson play him. Mm-hmm. But his own version, which doesn't quite jive with if it's in the same continuity as the uh, the main universe uh, with the future iteration that shows up in TOS. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like there's just there's I think the problem is they want to play it safe. They want to they want to make happy in my mind the old Star Trek nerds, like the old old guard, and not necessarily willing to risk it on the new people who are only experienced in the abrams verse and maybe have seen some episodes of voyager or enterprise in passing and i can see why maybe they're not setting it post um nemesis because it's hard to talk picard and company here the only people you really have to compete against is kirk and that cast is somewhat, and it's going to sound blasphemous for me to say this, has largely been forgotten because a lot of them are, unfortunately, have all passed away. Well, there's only three out of the seven that are gone. Yeah, like... There's Scotty, got... there's McCoy, and there's Spock. Kirk is still floating around, Chekhov, Sulu, and Uhura. Yeah, and I don't see them getting ready to do cameos anytime soon. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you've invite Brent Spiner to the craft services table, he'd show up. Um, no offense, Mr. Spiner, just you love your character. Um, but even Michael Dorn says he won't come out and do this because they offered him less than 1% of what he made when he was doing Wharf, which means literally, I'm pretty sure they offered him a Uber cab fare, craft services, and a t-shirt. <laughs> at this point, which is so disrespectful. Well, what I love in the franchise, and that's what I love about the Star Trek Online universe, is because you get everything post Nemesis and post. Yeah, um, like, so you get like all this continuity filled in from all these casts that we loved, plus a ton of new characters that you've never heard of. Um, 
So, like, it's it's kind of world building itself. And as far as I know, it's officially canon. It is. I mean, at least until they want to retcon it if they want to do a movie. But for right now, it's official. Well, the thing is, is they actually jump about 30 years after Nemesis. Or after mm-hmm. the Dominion War. And, like, the Borg are back. The Romulans are still trying to rebuild their ship. Well, there's actually two th- two factions of Romulans in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Tal Shiar. <laughs> Which I think is cool. Just the fact that they're trying to rebuild that world and to keep the TNG world alive, like I said, post-Nemesis, by adding the logical events that would have happened following the collapse of the Romulan Star Empire. And, stuff like that. And do you remember Enterprise where they had Agent Daniels? Vaguely. Um, well, he was in like a one one episode of all four seasons. Um, mm. Maybe two in a couple seasons. But uh, he shows up a lot in Star Trek Online. Uh, mm-hmm. Because he's kind of your guide whenever there's a temporal disturbance and you're having to go fix it. Um, including when you have to go to the Terran uni- or the uh, Kelvin universe. Um, See, and I think that's cool because they do give you the option in Star Trek Online to start off there. Well, they actually don't give you the option to start off in the Kelvin universe. Well, I thought they did. You had an option to play a character from from the 23rd century, and then you get jumped forward. Well, what it is is your character starts off um, in the uh, 30 years. It's uh, like 2380. Mm-hmm. And there's a big battle, and your character dies. Oh. Um, your your ship and your character, like they all die. And Daniels warps you ahead to the year twenty four ten. Um, to assist with modern day. To fix various things in the timeline and uh, assist in areas that the other characters may not be so capable. See, that's really cool. I mean, it's been a long time since I've played Star Trek Online, which is, I guess, I, I guess we, we could jump into that, because there isn't a whole lot to talk about Discovery, simply because there isn't a lot been revealed about it so far. Although, I do have a question about it, and I don't know whether it's ignorant to say or not, so I'm just going to fire from the hip and go from it. Now, the character who's been cast as the Lieutenant Commander was originally from The Walking Dead. She played Sasha. Yeah. And she's playing a character named Michael... What's what's the last name again? Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah. But, but yeah, now, I don't know. Uh, is she playing a woman? Is she playing a transgendered character? Because I've heard there's... like I've never run across a woman named Michael, but I hear it's a common thing. I've just never come across it in my personal experience. I've never come across it, but as far as I know, there's supposed to be a gay character in the show. Yeah. Of some so... kind. Yeah, so I, I'm really glad that they're going to have an LGBTQ character in the show, whether it's gay or transgendered or whatever. I'm just, it's it's cool, it's happening, I'm glad the future's inclusive, but I just kind of wish the wording on her character was a little bit more clear. See, I think it, that people would be fine with it if it weren't yeah. for the fact that, like, because I feel like they're doing it to be politically correct. And well, to kind of shove in it, the future. like I, I feel that in a sense that they're doing that to be politically correct. I mean, I understand that there are people that are that, um, mm-hmm. and and you know if that's your the way you go, then you know good for you. You know, it's I'm not dissing you or anything, but um, but I'm the, curious for the story possibilities it's it's going to bring up. It, it, see, like me, I, I watch Star Trek not so much for the orientation i watch it for the intelligence and if that starts to detract from the intelligence of it like how they did it in the kelvin universe with sulu Mm -hmm. just a passing nod i was perfectly fine with because they weren't like shoving it in my face but it was there i I, i'm very curious to see whether it'll develop into a true romantic subplot or whether it'll just be oh this character's getting a party on or whether it'll be this character has a boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever, and is it going to be a concern? Like, is let's say the character is uh, transgendered, is how is that going to be addressed? How are you going to write this character? And as long as it makes for compelling television, I'm all for it. 
because obviously right now, more than any other point in the last couple of years, we seem to be at a rather interesting social change where a lot more people are coming out as gay, transgendered or whatever. Um, and it's not something I understand as, you know, um, a straight native male in his thirties. Um, but I have, I'd like to consider myself an ally to the cause, though I still have a lot of questions, but ultimately, as long as the character's well represented, as long as it makes for compelling television. And as you said, as long as it's not a political statement, that's cool. If they're there, it, just, you know, if it, that's like the, the same, don't be a checklist. Yeah. Don't be a checklist. Be like essentially what the, yeah, the difference of when you know Troy dated an interspecies thing with Worf, or you know, it, it was there, but it wasn't like, it, it, yeah, yeah, it didn't yeah, detract from the show. He's like, don't be boring, don't be a checklist, be compelling, be interesting, be well represented. Because if Star Trek has done anything well, it tackles social issues, it's tackled racism. Uh, back in in the sixties, it's challenged. Well, it did it in the sixties. It did it with even with uh, data. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was just about to bring that up when it comes to how do you define a person or Odo so, or or the holographic doctor. I mean, every series has one of those characters. Yeah, and this series, because everyone's so hyper aware of it now, could really stand to make a really cool statement with it. So. I hope the series represents that community well. Like I said, please don't be a checklist. Yeah. Please be compelling. Uh, moving on to something a little less politically charged, though, yes. depending on, on who you ask. So Star Trek um, Online. So Star Trek Online. Um, this is a game I haven't played in probably about a year or two, though now it's available on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, if and it's available for free. Yep, it's been for free. Um... It's it's been out. Uh, I think six years, I think six it's, or it's seven years. Um, but it's it's um, it, it went free about three years ago, um, which is about when we started the show. And I think I tested it out around then, and I never got past Cadet because I got stuck uh, at the time they were doing this thing with the Borg. Yeah. And there weren't seasons, there weren't missions. It was just you play this one round, and that's all you got. And now, um, they've done the the marketplace type of design to the sh the the game. Uh, so like if you get special uh, boxes, like uncommon boxes or uh, infinity boxes, which infinity boxes are um, things of special offers that are only available for like a said week um, of the past. So for instance, the Kelvin Universe um, uh, Vengeance Ship or Enterprise, uh, you have to open an Infinity Box or a uh, Kelvin Box and you need a uh, Master Key to unlock. And the Master Keys are like 125 of whatever these, you know... Uh, Space box. Yeah, space box, basically. <laughs> um, and you have to actually buy them uh, to open the boxes. So uh, just like if you want to change their uniforms uh, to a certain degree, like you're allowed so many uh, outfits that you can unlock throughout the game or that are given to you freely. Um, and if you want to change it into a different, um, for instance, like if you want the uh, original series movie uniforms, uh, the red uh to do whatever you want with uh you you have there are like so many space bucks um and it's a, like that with a lot of the stuff like if you unlock one you might unlock like a plethora of other things um so there's and you can customize like everything down to the the character design the um the uniform the ship design uh there's a lot of ways that you can recolor it uh you can change out um so like if it's a uh uh, sovereign class starship you can change it out and have like parts from the nova ship like it, there's only certain ships that are in that category that you can mix and match it with but um so like the uh, constitution refit there's like three different classes like the that you can mix it with um but there's a lot of a lot of customization a lot of um character building uh you get to build your own away teams um you get to capture your own gear you get to send people from your crew on away missions to um, build up your experience uh, 
you can keep all of your ships that you've gotten throughout the game. And when you become an admiral, you can send them on missions to gain you uh, points. See, I wish I'd stuck with the Star Trek experience, because when this game first came out, I was doing a lot of work for a bunch of radio stations, and Atari, who was the original publisher for this, I think it's Cryptic Studios, I think was the actual developer. Cryptic Gave wasn't the me- original. It was, uh, I think Cryptic was part of it, but um, Arc actually, uh, Arc Games actually owns mm-hmm. part of it now. Uh, there was a different studio in charge at the time, and my cadet character uh, is forever stuck in a time loop fighting the Borg. Mm-hmm. Because when the game first went free, uh, that's... you had to log in, didn't you? Yeah, when when you log in, that was the the mission that I had, and I still cannot to this day get out of that that level. So, being it was only cadet, I started a new character. Um, and now I'm level 56 Admiral. Uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, it doesn't take long to level up until you hit like the Admiral stage. Like there's, uh, You start off uh, a Starfleet cadet, and you get your first bridge officer, because um, the, the thing is, is Starfleet apparently is running low on um, high-ranking individuals at the time, and so they're just <laughs> letting even lieutenants take commands of starships. Um. So you start off with like a Miranda class type of ship, um, and then when you get to Starfleet Lieutenant, you get to unlock a new ship, um, and you unlock like transwarp, so you can you can go to like the the Earth space station or the Beta Quadrant or you know something like that. Um, so like level one, you get to Starfleet Lieutenant. So I think uh, what happened is as I got the Miranda class, and then I got um, the original Enterprise. I, I went and got that, and then I became a lieutenant commander at level ten. I got the refit Enterprise, um, and then at level twenty, you become a commander, and you get like this almost like uh, stargazer with a galaxy class uh, saucer mm-hmm. um, of sorts, and then level thirty, you become a captain. And there's a particular mission where you end up with the Enterprise C because you actually end up in an alternate timeline. And it gives you the Enterprise C as like a bonus. That's pretty cool. Actually. Um, and then so like when I hit Captain, I got the Enterprise D. Um, and then when I hit Rear Admiral, Admiral at uh, uh, lower half, Rear Admiral lower half at level forty, I got the Sovereign Enterprise E. Uh, and then every five levels after that, they start leveling you up, so you become a Rear Admiral upper half, and then uh, Vice Admiral then uh, Starfleet Admiral, and then I'll be Starfleet Fleet Admiral after I hit level 60. Um, so, yeah, and I've got probably... Let me see how many episodes. There's uh, You start off with the, the Klingon War, uh, the Wasteland, which is like uh, the, kind of the galactic wasteland stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You get the Romulans... Um, and, and uh, technology through the Delta Quadrant. Sela shows up. Uh, Sela. Um, th- and then you get the Cardassians. Uh, you get the Breen, the Borg, uh, the New Romulus, the Solene Dyson Sphere. Um, a lot of going into the past, uh, Delta Quadrant stuff, which is like heavy with Voyager crew. Um, so, like, you get. Uh, the EMH, you get uh, Seven of Nine, you get Tuvok, you get Harry Kim. Um, and I could have swore there was like one other character. Oh, Neelix. Um, that all show up. And then there's the Iconian War, which is what I'm doing now. Um, and there's two more levels. There's Future Proof and New Frontiers after that. Um, which Future Proof is setting up the stuff from that Enterprise episode with uh, Daniels and where Archer goes to the 29th century and sees that Battle of Procreon 5. Um, and uh, Daniels basically tells him, you know, that you have to, you know, that they're in this particular, the 25th century, they start setting up the uh, with all the different factions, you know, the Romulans, the Klingons, the, the Federation, uh, the guidelines for the temporal laws. 
Um, mm-hmm. So then, and then on April twenty fifth, they're opening up another entire new episode. So, and there there could be as little as like three missions under your thing, or like twelve, or some of them seem like they're annoying. So, like if they are, I skip them. <laughs> See, I may have to get back into this now that it's on console. And you can actually so partner with people. See, that's cool because then I could just hang around with you, and you can like power level me, uh, yeah. basically. Yep, power level you, and then uh, give you some awesome gear. Now, when I originally got this game, I had a lifetime subscription. I hope it still mines gave, gives me all my cool shit. If you time. had that, I believe they I'll give you... Um, I believe it there's some perks work. that they give you um, in certain boxes Ooh. Um, based on your your uh sponsorship as it were yeah i hope so because i had like i could play as a former borg i had like the wrath of Khan out there. i had all this really cool crap i haven't logged into my account since like 2013 so it's been a while um should still work because my account my account i haven't used in three years and it i logged right back in Although a friend of mine, and I feel so tragically bad for him, he bought a lifetime subscription when the first game came, or when the game first came out. He didn't have a computer powerful enough to run it until literally this year. His account is lost because the company that originally gave it to him, the company that originally published it, doesn't or doesn't exist anymore, or at least has changed. This game has changed hands a few times. It's it's only changed hands once. Um... It but went, he can't get in. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. I'm sure you could get a hold of the uh, the people. Oh, he's too. tried. Huh? He's tried, and it makes me so sad because uh, when the game first came out, I remember you could buy lifetime subscriptions for a one-time only price of three hundred bucks. <coughs> so, ouch. Yeah, I. But, it came out in 2010. That's, yeah, because I remember this came out when I was just finishing post grad. Because uh, I remember playing this game when I got snowed in for like a week. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, I re- remember having fun with this game. Just me and MMOs just never seemed to get along. That When, the, when this game first came out, it was so boring. Oh, there was I agree. nothing to do. And the fleet actions were just a new thing when I stopped. And I remember fighting a Borg Armada and getting my ass utterly handed to me. So I kind of said nuts to this and left. Um, but now hearing your experiences with it, I may have to give it yet another run. Just because, I've, like I said, I've still got some time off from my like, twig and everything. So I have nothing but time on my hands right now. Yeah, so, so like they, they have, um, uh, what does it say? There are three factions, Federation, Klingon, Romulan. Um, this is, and players can create characters from any of these factions at level one. Uh, and uh, it says, um, and you can have bridge officers from a separate race. So you can have like a Borg uh, bridge officer, and you can have a, a Klingon, and you can have, it, it's kind of awesome. And then some of the voices are uh, Zachary Quinto, Leonard Nimoy, Chase Masterson, Majel Barrett, um, Denise Crosby, Michael Dorn. Um, like I said, the Voyager cast. Um, then there's... Uh, um, oh, yeah, they got Tom Paris. He's about to show up. Uh, and then somewhere in the next couple of missions. Um, and then you've got Walter Cohen uh, as Chekhov showing up. He'll be at some point in this thing. Um, Chris Duhan filling in for James Duhan um, as Scotty. Um, Matt Winston, the guy that plays Daniels, he reprises. Uh, Vic Mignona, or Mig, can't say his name, but he's Vic from Mignola. Yeah, he's from Star Trek Continues, but he plays Admiral Isaac Garrett, a member of the Starfleet Command in the 23rd century of the uh, Kelvin universe. See, I think that's really cool because considering how much work. Vic does with voice acting. I'm surprised. I'm I'm really glad his Star Trek enthusiasm and fandom 
Landon landed him a role in this, so his character is still canon. So. I recognized his his character um, or the voice, um, and then uh, Science Officer zero uh, seven one eight from Star Trek Into Darkness, the robotic android guy that was tied into the ship. Yeah, uh, he's in this too. See, that's really cool. I'm really glad that Star Trek Online has incorporated so many elements from so many different areas of star trek to keep it going so yeah there's 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 so much continuity in this that it in in jumping around of of different stuff that it's it's sick and the amount of starships and the upgrades for like any of the ships um is monumental now Uh, they have everything from like the show plus um new versions and uh like refits of those that have never been seen on tv as well as ships that have never been seen Mm mm-hmm so, like, there's literally, like, unlimited possibilities for everything? I'm, I'm going to have to get into it, and, and that's kind of <coughs> kind of exciting, the fact that an old game can be, can shake off a really rough start to become something kind of neat. And with most MMOs free to play these days, you've got no lack of choice. I mean, you still got World of Warcraft, Star Wars, the old republic and you don't have to sink money into these games if you don't want to with the exception of warcraft you're only free until level 20 then you have to start paying the monthly sub fee yeah this is completely free um unless you want to upgrade to certain um certain uh ships or unlock certain uniforms if you're a part of a uh, squad you can unlock uh certain features um somebody asked me to join like right away Mm-hmm. Like, I was, like, a lieutenant commander, and I was like, okay, and then I just accepted it, so, like, now I've gotten, like, all these perks just because of that, like, I can have an extra ship, I can have, you know, an extra, like, costume change for the characters, um, uh, you know, it, it unlocks other stuff, so, like, there's, I mean, there's benefits to everything. Um, so you're playing this on PC, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how the console experience uh, carries over, because I remember this game being quite heavy in all the keyboard commands that you had to enter, so... There's not really that many. I, I mostly use my mouse just to click the stuff, and then I, I use the WASD to move, and the shift button to run, and the space bar to jump. I mean, I'm sure I could use a, a controller if I wanted to, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's actually... Uh, it's actually not that bad. I mean, it's... I've gotten used to it. I mean, I have a gaming mouse now, too, so that, I guess, kind of helps, but... Um, so I would love to hear from people that are actually still actively playing this. So if you are still playing this, we'd love to hear from you. Now, one of our email addresses is currently being funky right now, but if you want to get a hold of us, you can email Mike at thisweekingeek.net, and we will read your email on the next show, or we'll just reply to you on Twitter, or we'll just write you back um, and say, hey, what's going on? Um <laughs> So, Steve, remind me to talk to you about the other email issue after the show. Not a problem. Um, but uh, another thing that I want to talk talk about is because I'm, like I said, I've got nothing but time on my hands right now. I've seen the entirety of TNG. I'm starting a watch through of DS9. And I've always wanted other shows to fill that sci-fi gap. And I recently discovered Stargate SG-1 which I've realized has been around for 20 years, but it's, it's the longest-running sci-fi show right now, or it was one of the longest-running. I think Supernatural, technically, and Smallville outrun it now. Well, uh, Supernatural is at 12, year 12. It's been renewed for another season or two. Um, oh, my God. How many times could you kill Satan? Um, I, he keeps coming back. <laughs> I'm not I even guess. joking, dude. That's I'm, ridiculous. I'm, I'm about done with the show. So I'm just discovering older sci-fi that was running at the time when we had Voyager was on the air, DS9 was starting to wind down, and before Enterprise would would appear and end its run back in 2005, I want to say, or 2004. So I'm having a lot of fun going through Stargate, and I kind of realized it's like TNG, but without the ship. Um, It's nothing but away missions, but with guns. Um, and I really enjoy Richard Dean Anderson. I love MacGyver as Colonel Jack O'Neill. And I don't know, there's just something about that show. I'm just, I'm having so much 
fun with that I didn't necessarily have with Star Trek because it's not as it's not as philosophical as Star Trek could be. I'm sure there's our episode I'm just in the second season now. Um, I'm sure that'll change at some point. It's not as gloomy as Battlestar Galactica or as political just yet. And I haven't started into anything like Atlantis or Universe. I haven't seen the movies like The Ark of Truth or whatnot. So, I don't know. It's Steve, have you seen SG-1? Uh, no, I mean, I've tried getting into Stargate. It just never really grabbed me. My recommendation to you is give it another shot. Watch the movie and watch like the first ten episodes. I watched the movie about a year ago and I found it to be horrible. <laughs> Although, oh my god, I think it's one of Roland... It, you know what? It's one of the movies that everybody forgets the guy who did in Independence Day and 2012 did. That was, I think it was one of his first movies, if not his first movie, Roland Emmerich. And I just, I kind of forgot how much cool lore the Stargate universe introduces. And when I think about it, when I compare it to Star Trek... I wonder if it may be as deep, because my friend Alex, who's walking me through the series right now, says with 10 seasons of multiple series, it's just as deep as Star Trek, it's just different. And I kind of find that to be an interesting companion, because I can't think of many other long-running sci-fi series that had a big ensemble cast, like Star Trek. Because Star, because we've got, in Stargate, we've got Jack O'Neill, uh, Samantha Carter, Daniel Jackson, and Teal'c, who's the cool uh, Jaffa guy, and I'm and I and then there's all the side, all the like side characters as well. With Star Trek, of course, we can name the entire bridge crew and even a few, even a few other smaller side characters like Lieutenant um, Barclay and whatnot. Funny so, you should say about. Uh... Some of those characters, like uh, Chief O'Brien. Yeah. He's actually the chief engineer of Enterprise F. That's cool. In the game. Because the Enterprise E, I guess, is destroyed at some point uh, during some mission. And uh, it was Captain Data as the captain. And Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Because B4 became actually Data at some yeah. point. Yeah. Um, it, it surfaced or whatever. And uh, so... Uh, he was the captain of the Enterprise E, um, and uh, the ship was destroyed, but he saved all the crew. So um, they built the Enterprise F out of the Odyssey class starship, um, which actually has this like cool vent just below the saucer and just above the uh, um, the the hull of the ship, so that it's got like extended airflow that goes through it, like space, so that it it actually gets faster warp speeds. Um, when you get it to a higher, uh, uh, when you become an admiral, I think you get to unlock uh, slipstream, which mm -hmm. which means you can travel across the galaxy that much faster. So, actually, pretty wicked. But um, yeah, that that just drove drove me to that point. But uh, another show I I know that it was sci fi that I I kind of caught a little bit of when it was new, um, was Star Trek or not Star Trek, uh, Andromeda. Andromeda is another show. Uh, once again, my friend Alex has got me to. Tr he's he's gonna get me to check that out in Farscape in the next little bit. And I know Andromeda was Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. Yep. With Hercules. Um, yep. As, Kevin Sorbo yeah. and as a producer. So that's another show I want to check out. I also know Gene Roddenberry also did a show during the nineties called Earth Two which I haven't had a chance to download yet. I don't know if it's available on DVD, but probably, all things considered. But, I mean, one of the cool things I want to do with Future and Perfect kind of going forward is check out some of these older and different sci-fi shows. I know one show Ryan Merkley, a.k.a. The Uneven Flow, has recommended to me for like a year now. is a show on sci-fi called The Expanse, which is supposed to be the best sci-fi show currently airing. So I'm very interested in just checking out what's new in the realms of science fiction. Since I've kind of caught up on Game of Thrones, what's the next thing to consume my life? So 
I guess I'm looking to get off of Westeros and to maybe board a starship. And now currently I'm in the Stargate universe. Where am I going to go next? So if you listeners have any ideas for me, Mike at thisweekingeek.net, give me some ideas. I really do want to check out some older shows. I'll check them out from different countries too. And before anybody suggests it, yes, I'm in the Doctor Who, but I haven't caught up on the latest Doctor. I'm about a season and a half behind. So I need to get around to to fixing that because Doctor Who seasons are nice and short. So that's like a weekend if I'm really bored. Um... I don't know, Steve, we should probably begin to wrap things up. Anything we want to ask our listeners or things we want to talk about next time? Well, like maybe what are some sci-fi shows that um, we should check out or uh, some games for that matter? Because, like, uh, I know we didn't get to touch on it this time, but uh, uh, even Mass Effect is kind of, in a sense, uh, it, kind of, it kind of reminds me of this, uh, this Star Trek game, in a sense, except you get to customize more than you would in Mass Effect. Um, and it's it's very world ability like so like there are scenarios where you can choose what you say to certain people and certain scenarios end up differently based on what you say absolutely yeah so next time on future imperfect yeah let's talk some really good world building video games so we'll talk mass effect we'll talk starcraft even stuff like eve online so Guys, give us your ideas. So Mike at thisweekingeek.net or or hit us up on Twitter at SCP21, that's Steve. Yep. Or at Birdman Dodd, I always reply. Or simply at This Week in Geek, which usually uh, Blanchard runs that one, but it'll get to us some way, somehow. So um, I know we used to have a Twitter account where it was Goofy Look at Spock. I don't know if we still have that. Future Spock. Um, yeah, yeah, Future Spock. Oh, Lord rest Leonard Nimoy's soul. What's sad um, is I knew... I, I made a really off-color joke. Um, the day he died? Please tell me you did it the day he died. Not the day he died. <laughs> uh, I did it a while before. I did it like the year we created it. And I, I says, watch, I'm going to post all this crap, and then next year he's going to, and yeah. then, sure enough. You're a terrible person. <laughs> I It's one of those predicting the future things, so I obviously need to shut up about it. Um, future Spock predicted his own death. Um, but yeah, guys, so thank you for joining us here on Future Imperfect. We always look forward to hearing from you. We do hope to do this show a little bit more often. Now that Steve has a more stable recording schedule... I'm getting a more stable recording schedule. We can always look forward to talking more sci-fi on this show as we await the premiere of Star Trek Discovery. Whenever the hell that will be, um, <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. So I guess until next time, we have been... Steve Megatron Phillips. And I've been Mike at the Birdman Dodge saying live long and prosper. <laughs>